high reality riffing, I was incredibly just so excited to talk to a poet that I have admired and read uh, his poetry for years, Lee Young Lee. He is a very accomplished and uh, accoladed poet um, and has such a mastery of language and of the way that language moves through human connectivity and human experience. The hour that we got to spend together is an hour that I will never forget in my life. And uh, some of the ways that um, he thinks about the world and thinks about frequency and thinks about love and uh, expresses it through language is literally just the most ecstatic and sublime. So we kind of go into a, a, a major moment together um, in one of, I think, my most brilliant um, and exceptional experiences for me as an interviewer, um, this conversation with the great, great mind and poet, Lee Young Lee. which is a technology. Just think of it as a technology. You're bringing a technology to the planet Earth that is necessary for humanity to really evolve to the next stage. You're essentially a group of women that formed a global network. And what Guru Jagat has, which is a kind of unique thing, is the aura to hold the network or hold the, uh, the web, if you will. Baby, I can see your hello. You know you're my saving grace. But you're, you think of yourself Everything as an historical person carrying a very precious technology that you, in your own individual, unique fashion, are going to broadcast and place and kind of, uh, what would you say, plant in the global matrix. And that's why we've come to these, uh, these camp graces which are growing and Hit me like a ray of sun Burning through my darkest night Oh, you're the only one that I want Think I'm addicted to your light I swore I'd never fall again But this don't even feel like falling Gravity cannot forget To pull me back to the ground again It's like you've been awakened Every rule I had you break it It's the risk that I'm taking I am never gonna shut you out Everywhere I'm looking up I'm surrounded by your embrace Baby, I can see your hello I pray it won't fade away I can see your hello I can feel your hello Hello, can see your hello, hello. Hello, Rama Festival and Reality Riffing. Oh, so honored to be joined by the prolific poet and author Lee Young Lee. 
He's the winner of over 12 awards and grants and fellowships, including the American Book Award and the William Carlos Williams Award, the National Endowment for the Arts and John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. And just, uh, I have to say personally that your poetry has literally, since I first read um, some of your poems years ago, just hung at like sound in my in my consciousness, and um, just very honored to be with you today. Thank you, thank you, Guru Jagat. It's a profound honor for me to be here. Thank you. So uh, we were, you know, we kind of were were talking before we went live, just about the creative process and. Um, I'd love to hear how poetry came to you. When you when did you know that words were forming in poems and that you needed to write them? Uh, I'm I'm trying to uh, answer that, but I'm thinking about what we just spoke about. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when did poems? start coming to you as a child, as a child. But I, I don't want to lose the, that, Guru Jagat, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, were, are, you're suggesting that there's uh, an ecstatic condition to living. Uh, it's not just a condition of um, art. See, that's what I think. That's what I think. <laughs> that must be possible, right? It's absolutely possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you had the experience? I mean, I would say that my whole life is the experience of it. And um, I mean, of course, there's moments of entropy, but pretty much it's it's a just an ongoing poem. I mean, that's really what my experience is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hmm. Hmm. Which, which, which then I do think one of the challenges, I'm curious, what, I mean, I'm curious your thoughts on this, but I do think that then one of the challenges is to create a boundary around actually creating a poem if you're kind of living inside the poem always then you know there are times when you have to have the discipline to also like actually write the poem down or do you know right. yeah yeah mm -hmm. which which is basically reducing uh i don't mean that in a negative way necessarily but a rendering right yeah right yeah uh, yeah, a boiling down. Of, that is taking, that's stepping out of the stream, isn't it? Well, I mean, this is where I think meditation and like the spirit, the wor world of the ethers or whatever you want to call it, spirit, I think this is where it intersects because if you can train yourself to stay in the meditation of or the flow of the energy or spirit or whatever, and also produce something. I think that that's like, I, I feel that's kind of where the ecstatic poet poets, like the lineage of ecstatic poetry. I mean, I feel like that's kind of the well of, of where that comes from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that the poem isn't a stepping outside of time, it's a remaining inside of time, but hmm. it's not a suspension of reality, right? It's an engagement with reality on different terms, in linguistic terms. Right. But those are real narrow, which is fine. I mean, all mediums are narrow, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although, I mean, and I, this is something that I, you know, really was touched by your work uh, right away is that inside the, the chambers of the words that you use um, is a huge expanse. 
so it doesn't feel narrow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. It's, it's true. So Thank you. Yeah. That's part of the, the mystery and the beauty of the medium, uh, that in its, uh, in its boundaries, in its, what, what the word narrow isn't right, but, but it's an, in its limits, uh, by it, virtue of its limits, it actually can inflect things that are not, uh, that have other properties like eternity and things like that, you know, but, yeah. but, uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I need, I, I, I need to focus here. Uh, oh, I love it. I'm so into it. No need to focus. We're, 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 we're this is perfect. No, Guru Jagat, I, I wanted to ask you, are you familiar with the first hexagram of the I Ching? I am. The creative. Yeah. What do you make of that? Is that? Does that sound right to you? Well, my experience of, of the I Ching, which is very innocent in terms of it was part of my very much part of my childhood um so it was almost like i i took the hexagrams in as a glyph themselves like a, a, that they were sound themselves and um that is how i kind of experienced the teaching so wow. it was much less about kind of what the dis i mean of course the de the the description but the 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 actual um a glyph or the almost like what we would say in now in in technological language the the uh microchip of the hexagram was something that would just hit m me in my consciousness like almost in my third eye um, so in terms of that, that first one, it was like all, it's like it, in Genesis, in the beginning, there was the word and the word was God, the grew the, the generating, organizing, delivering, you know, the, the first, all that is primal. Um, that to me is kind of, if we're going to put it in, in, in those terms that, that, that way, it's this, you know, the beginning of the beginning that is the beginning that there is no beginning of <laughs> kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. In, in you? Mm. No, I, 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 so, no, may I hear more about what else, what other, what other uh, uh, qualities uh, uh, of the creative with that, with that glyph in your body, what, what, what that, were there other, uh, that's fascinating. It, it was, I mean, you know, because uh, Dr. Emoto's work came out, you know, much later than that, but it was kind of this molecular, like I would see the glyph and mm -hmm. I would feel the molecule of my, of my body changing. And I do feel, I mean, this is totally just my, my experience and opinion. I feel that that talk about, you know, an ecstatic, a, a channeling of ecstatic, mm -hmm. um, this isn't the right word, but it's the word that came wealth, you know, ecstatic, just the, the treasure of, of the, those teachings in, in the I Ching that the I Ching holds. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's very much, uh, I think it moves, the river of it moves in multi dimensions. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the language of the, the glyphs or the hexagrams themselves and how they move. I mean, that's like, that was what really hit me as a child is like the movement of that was a whole language unto itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now, did you understand that movement? Uh, Guruja, may we take this little detour into the Yeah, thing? Yeah, let's do it. I love do it. You, do, do you understand that movement, uh, like in that circle, uh, as as it's laid out, or is it a different variation of for each of us? How, how do you understand that? Um, Is my question clear. Give me more on it. Well, it, the, it, the book is in a sequence, one to yeah. sixty-four. Yeah. That is that the. Uh, 
are they proposing that that's the movement of all of our lives or those 64 things in different orders in all of our well i i mean you know i think you could put it like i would put it in some different uh, um some different places just in terms of the like as a yogic scientist i would i would put the that movement like the movement of um uh, asan or the way that the body takes these different shapes in kind of the yogic um sciences or mudra the way that the hands take a different shape and that changes the consciousness it changes the flow of energy um so you could put it in that realm um, which I certainly think that, that that there's you know much resonance and and connectivity to all of the ancient scriptures and and wisdoms and knowledges, um, and then you could also put it into um, the realm of the elementals and and how I mean I think like as a child I saw the movement the literal physical movement of how the glyph changed from 1 through 64 how they went through the changes as almost a a, a language of evolution mm-hmm. or something i mean that's not even close to the what it, what it really like like you know occurred to me as but that's the you know those are that those are words yeah 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 boy you're speaking on a a really that's a deeper level you're talking at but we have to use these words yeah uh, yeah yeah the e king has always fascinated me and what it means and um you know it seems to me that buried inside of it are somehow encoded wow that is something that the glyph spoke to you so so deeply and truly man i haven't let that happen to me yet well i think that they you know i think all of these kind of ancient wisdoms have they're encased in superstitions and and you know this is used kind of to answer a problem or fortune tell or you know again like those are like a little bit of simplistic ways to describe it but i think a lot of these deep very profound before i would say before even you know time began where these wisdoms were you know kind of brought down into these different um these different formations like the I Ching and all the, all the great kind of um, wisdom teachings, then they have kind of these layers of different ways that they're used in a more pop culture or in a religious context or a, but really there's many layers of secret teachings. Mm-hmm. Wow, I love the way you're thinking. I love the way you think. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Would, would you think, I'm curious, Guru Jagat. Yeah. You could, uh, the I Ching, it seems to me, is one of those things that it's infinitely, it's worthy of infinite interest. Yeah. But so is the violin. So it's playing the violin. So it's just listening to the violin. Uh, so my question is, there's so many things that, that were surrounded by infinitely interesting things. And yet when I think about ourselves, we're uh, finite. Uh, we're finite. Yeah. Are we finite? <laughs> I mean, this is the Our question. <laughs> yeah. I have you don't think we are. I think that that the vehicle that we're in is finite um, in 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 uh, human incarnation. But I don't. I think that that's really the only. I mean, it's kind of inverse to what we're told. Basically, I, I remember seeing this image of. It's like a you know, maybe two thousand year old, maybe not quite book. Um, 
that was passed from in the in the kind of esoteric Jewish traditions and um, Kabbalah. And I saw a, a kind of rendition of the soul in the body um, in, in some way must be kind of a tree of life as well. But it was kind of this soul was you know, this huge, vast, um, infinite, and then it was kind of lodged into the 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 chest um that's the point of contact of this infinite force that goes on and on and on and then it kind of just gets stuck you know into gets like like uh jammed into a physical body and then we forget you know we forget and we think that that's that's all that we are so and then you know sometimes we remember through um, through art or through awakening of, of one sort or another, through heartbreak, through um, the wind, you know, blowing a certain way you know, on, our, on our body, whatever, those things. That remind us of our original. Yeah, it even scares me to say it. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm afraid, what if that's one more misdirection? That we really are just, you know, uh, that, that, that there is no infinite to us and just the finite? You know, yeah. I, and I just temperamentally, I resist, the, I, I, don't, I don't believe it. Yeah. I don't believe that. But I'm just so afraid. Yeah. What if I just I just assume it, I point that way, and it's another misdirection? Well, I think the only, I mean, especially now, in the world that we're living, with all of the complexity and the information, the disease of, of, of over-information, the saturation, the the only thing we have is the guidance of some inner compass to to show us that we're either in a mistake or we're in a direction that's at least more enjoyable or more fun or more inspiring or more so you know i think if there's if we go down that road then maybe the only thing that's infinite is the is the compass the the consciousness or the the you know feeling or the frequency of you know what what if we take a mistake maybe we can you know take move in a different direction and it's more in a direction that is a right action and that's the kind of self um self-regulating experience mm. mm-hmm Mm -hmm. But I think that's good. You know, I, I think it's a big spiritual misnomer and like kind of broad stroke that you're not supposed to be afraid of one side or the other of our infinity or finite. I think that the fear actually is um, part of the process. You know what I'm thinking about, Guru Jagat, is right now is, is it possible that I don't know it, but infinity, it feels concrete to me, but the fact of the matter is I couldn't point to it. Right. But it's possible that infinity is a concept that when it gets refracted into material reality, the first level of that infinity, it, it may... may it's a vantage point from which to make earthly material decisions. It's just uh, a smart place to be in your head when you're making even earthly material decisions. Uh, and, and if that's like one of its in one of the ways it manifests, uh, I'm curious as to how other concepts formations get manifested in the in our daily lives when we think 
um, I'm kind of amazed to think about that infinity is just a concept. I don't actually, do I experience it? Are there other, other like, mo that's the other thing, Guru Jagat. I, I, I wonder, you can, you can create these things in, with, with an art form, with a painting, yeah. with a poem. You can create experiences of infinity, eternity. But what am I actually, what if those are just creations? See, that's my, they're not, what do I, what if they're inventions? What if they're not the uncovering of something that's actually there? And what if I can't tell the difference? Well, I think this goes back to what we were talking about, you know, at the beginning before we went live is what if the creativity, the act of the creation in and of itself is the only way or the most direct way that we can touch the infinite. So therefore, you don't need to know. You just need to create. Hmm. And uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I love you. <laughs> wow, that's huge. Yeah. That's something we should go. We, I should. I want to go up on the rooftop right now. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll wait. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> but what you're saying is huge, right? Wait a minute. Yeah. That's mm, that's kind of the promised path of of fertile a uh, freedom that is fertile, that creative freedom that leads to creativity as opposed to just freedom to freedom. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. I've been wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a myth? <laughs> These days it is, isn't it? <laughs> I'm, mm. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I have something in me that was given to me through my spiritual lineage, which is a story of a Rinpoche who spent, uh, you know, most of his adult life in prison. And um, his, when he, when he was freed and was able to teach again, he said that the, the catacombs that he discovered inside of his own mind when the body was imprisoned was um, the most freedom that he had ever experienced. And um, that's, that's stayed with me for, for long, for forever. Um, but uh, definitely during these current circumstances that, but I also feel that we're always on, in this particular dimension, we're always dealing with polarity. So the moment that you're kind of in some f freedom, you're, you're triggering the, opposite and then the other way around and that's kind of the beautiful polarity that we get to dance with here in when we're in the 3d right right the 3d yeah no but in the realm of freedom is that more dimensions or less it must be more but he's the you that Rinpoche was talking about an in, in inward dimension. Yeah. 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 How do we know that's not an illusion? Well, I mean, I think it's the same way that any truth pierces through time and space and the truth proves itself, not the other way around. That's how you get the eternal truths is that it, through time and space, it, it, it like the I Ching, you know, why has it, has it moved through time and space and maybe through more, you know, through the, the, the mind stream of many different kind of enlightened and then finally was written down or who knows, but um, these things have their own 
velocity. Truth has its own velocity. Mm. Mm -hmm. Truth its own velocity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it must have its own frequency too. It does. It its own that's that's a realm. These are all different realms, right? They are. They are. And, the, and that's why, you know, kind of like a string theory may be the closest thing to describing the eternal. Because, you, you know, you're basically describing going through different realms of consciousness, but you could call it time. You could call it space or both or all. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Wow. 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 Man. Through a jug of, and like, what are we doing, right? I we don't should, know. What are we doing? We should be doing tambourines. We should be, we should blow. <laughs> we need trumpets. <laughs> yeah, I should be dancing with like Christmas magnets, I feel like. There should, we should be smashing. Ta it, it's, it's where, but man, the world is so, there's so much suffering. I know. What's, up with that is it true <laughs> uh, uh, I, I i read somebody said no, no no there's actually less less poverty less starvation the statistics say there's less yeah. but why is it when i uh, maybe i watch too much news i feel like there's just massive suffering yeah well suffering is uh, th there's the eternal truth that the Buddha himself, his first teaching of, you know, when he, um, when he reached a certain frequency, which we could call enlightenment, but you know, when that, when that pop happened for him, I mean, that's the first thing he said is we're all suffering, which then kind of democratizes it and, and allows for there to be levity. It, 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 it basically triggers the polarity is uh, if we're all suffering, then, you know, I guess we're all in it together or whatever. I mean, you could say a million things. I'm not gonna, um, you know, it's profound, so I don't want to um, make it, you know, too uh, simple, but it, it does create this kind of leveling of the, the, the playing field. Um, however, truth, uh, I'm sorry, suffering in this um, time has become, it's a commodity. It's traded on the stock market, basically. So that's a different, I think that's a different yeah. kind of level of it. Yeah. Wow. You know, um, I was wondering whether or not that's, I, I don't want to sound, uh, I'm just going to say this, Guru Jai, and yeah. please, you know, if it's offensive, I've been wondering about the archetype of the Antichrist yeah. and whether or not it is the false victim. If the, if, whether or not you believe that Jesus was real or whatever, there was an archetype of the true victim, the truly innocent person, who did not deserve something, right? Right. If that's the Christ model, innocence, the real victim, the Antichrist would be the false victim. Right. And sometimes I think that archetype is kind of scary because you can't tell the difference right, between a real victim I'm not saying it right. I'm not saying it right. Well, I mean, it rings a lot of bells for me just in like current context of how the internet culture and cancel culture and social media and just all the kind of technological age uh, weapon, the, what, what has been weaponized to actually create what you're describing as the Antichrist, which is, you know, the the... Um, those who cry wolf are, you know, yeah. um, are are oftentimes, you know, falsifying, and those who are actually innocent are 
being canceled and being, you know, right. run after by by the mob, the internet mob and the trolls. Right. And so, I mean, it's very current, I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's going to be very, boy, that's kind of scary. Yeah. It's the worst for the real victims, right? They'll get, they get yeah. lost in the whole thing. Absolutely. It, it's the, that, that is the, and maybe, I mean, yeah, you really, you do see that even in the allegories of the Bible. I mean, which are, you know, very far from the way that we live now, but um, even now people, people, the, the current kind of modern iteration, of this is, People are afraid to lose their livelihoods and their, their you know, whatever, um, if they say the wrong thing or they say something that's not polit the, the current political correct, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, um, or they've done something in their past that wasn't their best moment. I mean, you know, welcome to being a human. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating yeah. definition. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, boy, I was reading a uh, a fascinating uh, a part of the uh, the Rig Veda. Uh, was it the Rig Veda? Where it's all about sacrifice and how it was really dark. Uh, charismatic vision. Yeah. That the earth is an altar on which sacrifice is constantly being enacted. Mm -hmm. That was just such a terrifying. Uh, and I want to misread, I, I want to read it again to make sure I didn't misread that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But as I was reading it, I was thinking, and, and it talks about the sacrifice and the nature of the sacrifice. And sometimes the sacrifice will come to life and it has a personality. And the priest will see the personality of the sacrifice in the fire. He will see its eyes or she will see its eyes or she will see some aspect mm. uh, the priest will see some aspect of the sacrifice uh, and i thought that is a terrifying <laughs> but i don't know when i look around i think okay so all life displaces other life forms in order to go on i mean on the most element element yeah. level right yeah so maybe they're trying to account for that and then I started thinking about Sophocles and how Oedipus, no, no, Sophocles? Uh, yeah, th there's a Greek play called The Back Guy. And the first scene, there's a giant altar on it, in the middle of the stage. And everything surrounds this altar. And uh, I guess I've been trying to, think about the nature of suffering hmm. and i keep thinking maybe that's one of the faces of the sacrifice and we were we don't want to see it but the rig veda the writer of the rig veda saw it and said it well i again i you know i think that part of what ha in in i feel like this is part of what has to happen right now like this is the intersection of of the evolutionary path if we so choose because we have will we have free will of what's happening on the planet both individually and collectively but um that the sacrifice, the, the sacrifice has to, you know, to, to, to kind of the vibrationally um, be taken out of some of the lower realms or like the hell realms is what I would call them, um, which definitely the planet Earth is exhibiting uh, symptoms of, of, of some aspects of these hell realms. Um, 
in order to be kind of taken out of that, and you read this in the Tibet, you know, in the Tibetan, in all sorts of different uh, lineages and scriptures, and and um, you know, uh, thought. Um, but in order for it to be risen out of that kind of hell realm frequency, this the next sacrifice has to be that we sacrifice our our addiction to suffering itself, or our our you know, kind of compulsion or um, tendency towards suffering itself. And it's kind of like in Buddhism, the one of the last things you have to do is you have to sacrifice your belief system of being a Buddhist. Like the, that has now calcified into something that is keeping you actually from having a direct experience of your own infinite nature. And um, similarly with that, with this kind of like the altar of the planet Earth or however we want to kind of put it, that the suffering that's happened here on the planet Earth has to now be become the sacrifice. We have to be willing to actually live in a different way and think in a different way and, and, and move forward in a different way. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Of course. Yeah. I think I think I I think I knew this, Guru Jagat. But the, I, 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 something inside of me feels like, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Huh. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. I I have the sense, Guru Jagat, that you're you. Wow, you are you 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 basically want a total concretization of this promised consciousness that all the great religions have been talking about. Am, am I hearing you right? You want that? You you th you believe we can live it now? Is that right? I believe we have a chance that there is an opportunity that's part of the heaviness of all the suffering that we that kind of has molded and shaped the last you know you could say 2000 but way more than that years on planet earth and the civilizations and the epigenetics and the and the lineages and the ancestry and the and the formation of um of the empires that have risen and fallen and and just all that has formed and um then deconstructed on planet earth um in known and unknown history i believe we're at a moment where we have an opportunity to move just like a crossroads in our lifetime where we, we, you know, maybe looking back, maybe we didn't know it in the moment, but some part of us knew it, that we have an opportunity to um, move t into a different sort of uh, human civilization species. I mean, even the, the actual kind of genetic code um, has to and is, I believe, changing in some way. If you see these, you know, children who are who are being born with an, you know, an iPhone in their hands, and you know, I mean, then they, they know how to use it. I mean, we didn't know how to use an iPhone, but how how is that? How you know? So even the genetic, not that I'm saying that that's evolution, but I'm just saying that even the whole kind of genetic structure in some way is having to change. So. Yeah, no, I think we're at a crossroads. I really do feel that. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I know all this, Guja. I know all this. Yeah. I know it. I just need to. Rem I need to remember it. Yeah. I need to remember it because I sometimes lose faith. You know, I think like even that, right? That 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 to propose something like that in, in a work. You stand back and wonder, well, wait a minute, what if that's not, what if that's just whistling in the dark? Yeah. But it, yeah, what if it's just whistling in the dark? Right. <laughs> it tells me it isn't. Something tells me it isn't. Something tells me that, yeah, like even we know things change, right? And we can, what if we're whistling in the dark? Well, if we're whistling in the dark, I mean, then you just, this is where the levity has to come, which is that 
well, if we're listening, if we're, if we're listening slash whistling in the dark, um, the thing that is, is I think an eternal truth is that that part of you that knows this, you as in me, as in anyone, um, who's, you know, kind of searching or scanning for eternity. Well, eternity is searching and scanning for us simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And so. Wait, you just made a jump there. Well, how, how do you know that? How do we know that? Well, I mean, that this is what I would call and I would call this a universal truth. Um, because I, you know, because I can feel it in my, um, I mean, I don't even know how to put words to how I know it. You know, it's like, it's like a, like, it's a whole kind of, um, deep knowing, but also it's through art that I know it, that it's, you know, when you, cause I'll bring it back to poetry. When you, you know, we think we're writing the poem, but I, I don't actually think that that's what's happening. I mean, I think that the, the yeah. poem has found us and, you know, if we're sensitive enough and we're uh, w- w- listening enough, you know, we have to be the scribe of it, but it's a two way street. Yeah. 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 And in fact, you know, You know, I think when you made the jump from we're searching, the universe is also searching for us. Yeah. That jump is a jump not not just in logic. It's not a therefore. It's, It's a jump from one rationale to another rationale. And it seems to me that it's an abandonment of you know what? You know what, Guru Jagat, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. <clears throat> I think the rational faculty is very important. Yeah. But it is so sadly incomplete. Yeah. The rational faculty, and maybe what it comes down to is you can't get there. You can't get to the conclusion the universe is looking for us too. Rationally. Forget it. You're, you're, you're not going to get there rationally. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, my mitochondria is doing more work now as we speak. It's been doing work for 63, the 63 years of my life. Yeah. I didn't know it was doing work. And I think my brain is doing all the work. So I use my brain, right? So I ask right. questions like that. Like, How do I know that? How do I know this? I, I'm stuck in the brain. But once there must be other realms of knowledge, right? There must be. And, and, and maybe art, maybe meditation, contemplation, these are all other. It's not, they're not other uses of the rationale. They're other realms of knowing. Right. Other, other, and, and maybe, maybe you just can't get there rationally. There's no, no point in it. Hence the Cohen, right? right? The great Zen Cohen is to say, stop thinking. You're not going to get there that way. Yeah. That vehicle will not get you there. So, boy, we're all over the place, Guja. And I'm, I'm really sorry. I, uh, oh, I love it. I, this is, I mean, I'm talking I've, about something. <laughs> I love it. But, you know, I would say, I mean, this is just kind of through my my searching for the lineage of sound through language that goes beyond time. And, and it's a great quest of mine. And, you know, one of the uh, kind of, I think, uh, formation, you know, formative um, uh, works around that is a book uh, by Robert Graves called The White Goddess. Um, but he talks about something called super logic. And in it, it, when I kind of intersect that with my spiritual practice and and my artistic practices i think that super logic is a way of kind of taking the rational and and letting it alchemize 
into so the the logic actually leads you to the intuition or to the the knowing um rather than you know some sort of uh cognitive dissonance or even um uh just it, letting go of your your rationale and making some sort of quantum leap into the unknown or whatever we want to call it. I think super logic is the closest thing I've found that is a vehicle of transportation or alchemy. I think it's alchemy that kind of leads you into the land of the intuitive or the unseen or the the mystical the, the uh, uh, there's a term called choiceless magic it's like each poem i think is an act of choiceless magic it's an act of alchemy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah wow i wish i could write a poem <laughs> I, yeah. want, I want you to. I, I, I love that condition of choiceless magic. <laughs> I know. Like, like choiceless, and yet you, your hand is moving. Yeah. Writing words, but you're, but something else is there. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I haven't done it in a while. I've just been so, been revising and reading. And... Yeah. Do you write poems, Guru Chagas? I do. I do. do. Yeah. I do. Under the, do you publish poems? Would I find them on the internet? No, I I publish I, I publish prose, and I I my next it, my next thing is is poetry book. But I had to finish this irritating two hundred page prose um, situation, and I'm kind of just wow. finished. But yeah, this is my next thing because I thank you, thank you. It's it wasn't as beautiful it wasn't as fun as my first book my se the second book has been like a messy situation um i'm sure you can i'm i'm curious your experience between writing you know like prose and poetry it, it, how does that work for you oh horrible just horrible it's horrible it's horrible <laughs> <laughs> it's just a massacre <laughs> yeah it might, I mean, <laughs> so it, it, writing prose was horrible for you? Yeah, it's just, I mean, uh, I, I have to do it because I have yeah. to kind of, but I mean, I just feel like massacred. Yeah. Yeah. Wh why is that? <laughs> I mean, I, I think partly because it's like the, the, I mean, not like from a, you know, rebel for no cause kind of thing. But gr grammar, I I don't know. My experience is I've trained myself to to have kind of this rainbow spectrum of l linguistics and where words fit and how things go across a page. So then when I have to go back into prose, I just feel like I'm you know, how, like, oh, I have to put a comma there and, and my sentence can't be like three pages long and all that kind of stuff yeah <laughs> you yeah, know yeah 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 which, which made sense when i was writing it. in fact it was quite beautiful but then you go back yeah. to it and it's like oh this is a shit yeah. show yeah 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 the imagination's different too right yeah like uh, when i was writing uh i had to write something like a memoir and i would write like i was born in this town on this date and then the poet in me says you know uh, the dead should speak now Right. <laughs> and you go, no, 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 continue with that thought. You were born in this, where did you go to school? And you go, you know, that loaf of bread had a life too. <laughs> the grain was alive once before it entered the oven. Then you have images of immolation. You think you go there. But the prose writer says, no, 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 you were talking about where you went to school. Right. It, it really is like that. It right? is. The poet keeps saying, Oh, that old broom is the most beautiful thing. It should have a voice now. It should speak up now. You've already, you've already, you know, I'm sorry. I, I didn't, people are, did you hear the ping on my yeah. the message thing? I don't know how to pick it up. <laughs> oh, don't worry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a, but it's, yeah. It, yeah, no, this is, this is, this is it. But we should then, yeah, hmm, yeah, yeah, <laughs> hmm, how, how do you do, I, I yeah, the prose thing. It's a, I don't know how they do it. It's really, it's really, you know, I, I mean, I took it as kind of like a Spartan, especially the second book, um, 
I took it as like a like a stoic Spartan kind of thing, but it was a painful experience. It was not ecstatic. And was it uh, um, uh, nonfiction? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Both of the both of the books, the second book too. So that being said, I have a bunch of poems that have, are written and then you know just kind of like banging my you know banging me in the head that have to be written that are definitely the next thing. Oh wow! Would you would you honor us and read some a couple poems? Yeah, I would. I would love to. I would love to. Uh... Uh, I, I don't know what to read. Uh, <laughs> you know, make, make, uh, maybe I'll read a couple of these poems that I've been working on. Uh, we would love it. But, uh, you know, I was working with a sitar player. And man, I was just in love with his sitar. Mm. You know, the more I listened to him, and he talked about his sitar uh, uh, in the feminine. Yeah. And I, I of course, thought naturally, I thought, um, I mean, even without him having mentioned that, I, the, the, I thought about it as feminine. Then when he mentioned it, I thought, oh, okay, so he feels that way too. And then uh, I was hearing things in his playing and I would remark them. I'd say, hey, I, those two notes you played, there's something else going on there. And, and he would sometimes say, well, no, nothing's going on there. You know, he said, I, I know the sitar better than you, so don't. So I would try to stay in my lane. But I was just in love with this sitar. Mm. So, uh, so I thought about it as a, as a woman. And... Uh, And these, and I wrote this, these things down. I don't know, I, I don't know if uh, this says anything. This is called The Invention of the Darling. Hmm. My friend and I are in love with the same woman. He says, her kisses open wounds in me through which you can see all the way to the smoke rising from those ancient altars, streaming with the wine, milk, and fresh blood of our earliest rites and ceremonies. Sacred love has savage roots, he says. Is that the woman I know, I wonder? He says, I'm an illuminated book written in a language I don't know and full of images difficult to interpret. In the light of her reading, her eyes waking each letter of me, her fingers running along each sentence of me, her voice sounding each phrase of me, her breath touching each pause in me, the pictures move, and every syllable burns, bright, ringing, to disclose the grief-stricken paths of wisdom. All lovers begin in hell and end in knowledge, he says. Is that the woman I meet each night, I ask myself. I wish I could play an instrument. I'd write a song about her. I wish I could sing. I'd sing about her. I wish I could write a poem. Every line would be about her. Instead, I listen to my friend speak about this woman we both love, and I think about all of the ways she is unlike anything he says about her and everything else in the world. That might be too long. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Thank Ooh, you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I want to say to you, which we could have a longer, different conversation some other day about, but in the yogic science, the raga, ra, sun, god, ga, is like the earth goddess. 
and the the frequencies and the har- the harmonies of the sitar follow that path of enlightenment so it's very wow. deep wow so to identify the sitar with a goddess is not that's not i, I mean that's not my delusion <laughs> no yeah no yeah in fact i mean and and then then there's all all the like kind of iconography around it too but the actual sounds the way they they you know kind of the harmonics of the sitar they it was constructed to uh open your third eye those sounds by the great yogis wow he mentioned something like a god note yeah. He said, a, here's the God note. And I didn't know if I was hearing him right. I kept thinking, God? God? Is that a composer? What does he mean? You know, maybe I think now I'm thinking, I think he meant God note. Yeah. God note. He kept, every time he plays it, then there's the God note again. There's the God note. There's the God. Right, right. I'm trying, you know, and uh, yeah, I'm just in love with this, you know, and. Uh, I, I I taped him. I I just can't stop listening to the tape over and over. It's, it's like longing for a beloved, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, the beloved. I'm obsessed with the beloved. I'm obsessed with the beloved. Yeah. I, I hope I live up to the beloved. Mm. You know. I hope I'm. A, I, I hope I'm. Mm. I hope I'm a, but, uh, yeah, so I just wrote all these poems about being in love with the same woman. I love it. Yeah, and then I I read I I I read it to somebody, and they they lost the thread, and they said the, the well they they forgot it was about a sitar, you know. So so I I don't know whether I I liked that or whether I didn't like it or whether. But anyway, here, should I read you another one? Yes, I about- yes, we would love that. I, I want to keep an eye on the time. Yeah, it, just uh, maybe one more, and then um, okay. I, I also want to honor your time. Okay. Uh, my friend and I are in love with the same woman. He speaks one language with her, and I speak another. She loves what's different about us and what's the same. He was born so he will die. I was born. I too must die. That makes us members of the hungry and the thirsty. She requires our hunger. Orphaned, she calls it. She insists on our thirst. Sprung from death's deathless fountain, she says. He and I are one in our love for her. With no words to speak about our love, we're each one more alone. One in our bewilderment, we're two, each apart with his share of her. Sometimes when she's lying between us, I watch amazed as his fingers turn her entirely into a body of glistening sobs and joyful tremors and then i vow to give the rest of my life to know her as deeply as he knows her once a troubled voice only i sometimes hear asked do you really mean the rest of your life can you begin a new kind of love at your age what will people think and as if reading my mind she turned toward me and said Anyone who questions himself at such a moment doesn't belong here. My friend and I are in love with the same woman. That makes us brothers. Our love for her is a secret. That makes us brothers twice over. She's in love with each of us alone and both of us together. What's that make us? Wings of one bird, opposite terminals to her luminous arc, 
upper and lower hemispheres of her circle, the pick and fret of her, sun and moon of her, silver and glass of her, sun side and moss side of her. Yes, 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 oh yes. Thank you, Guru Jagat. Oh Perfect. my God. Thank you, thank you. Are, the, are, are are these coming in a new book or that's not happening yet? Yeah, the, I think the next book uh, will be, uh, the majority of it will be these, these poems. Oh, they're amazing. Thank you, Guru Jagat. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. And for thank you. being you. Th thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. I'm going to try to live up to this. I'm going to try to live up to what you're saying, what you're what you're putting out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for more than I can even say the sounds that are echoing in time that you've created. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Reality Riffing. These are conversations that I think are important with people who are doing great things in the world about subject matters that need to be discussed. If you enjoyed the content, the conversation, please feel free to share with your people, share with your friends and family, rate the podcast below, and also subscribe. <laughs>